The reason I really wrote this book is I mentioned a couple of uh, cases uh, that I was involved in in the book. One, uh, almost some 25 years ago in 1990, the Rawling murder trial, which uh, was an awful situation of a mass murder in Gainesville. Uh, the press was seeking access to those photos, and I represented the uh, parents and siblings. Uh, we were able to work with the media and have uh, arranged for those pictures never to be published. It's, it's interesting. That was the, uh, in that period of time, the principal parties were people like the New York Times, Chicago Tribune. Uh, so none of those folks would have ever published uh, those types of crime scene photos. But there were some media outlets that would have. Uh, in, in about 2000, I represented the, the family of Dale Earnhardt after he died. And at that point, there was a desire for, by some to publish his autopsy photographs. Uh, that was, uh, at that time, there was a beginning of a new, new kind of media. There were websites, uh, in fact, websites called death.com that were in the business of publishing uh, autopsy photographs of, of celebrities. So there's no doubt that they would have been published. Uh, again, the, the judge uh, allowed us to prevail in an argument where we were balancing the value of distributing information versus the intrusion. And I'll parenthetically say, since uh, I know you understand this, is uh, the written autopsy provided a great deal of information. As a matter of fact, experts who looked at the photographs and the written autopsy said the written autopsy provided more information accurately than the photographs, but the photographs were far more damaging to the family. Uh, and then recently in uh, I think it was 2012, uh, you may have heard about the uh, SeaWorld trainer who died. Uh, she was pulled underwater by a killer whale. Uh, there was an underwater video of her. Uh, by this time, of course, YouTube existed, and it was quite clear that if it was re released, it probably would have been instantly been all over the Internet. Uh, the judge was sympathetic as well. So these were examples that uh, to me uh, required some further thought about balancing uh, media openness uh, with individual privacy and also demonstrated the evolution of the media from the traditional written media to, to a, uh, a social and uh, individual type of distribution which is very different. So technology is key. Uh, technology that allows us to gather a lot more information, to distribute a lot more information, for everybody to be a reporter. And I know in your uh, study of communications, you would understand the old newsroom. You know, part of my images of the news used to be the folks sitting around with little green shades and talking to each other about what would be the uh, the right story. Uh, talking to their editor if they should publish it. And today there's frequently one person who may be anonymous uh, in a position to publish maybe to just as many people as some of those newspapers. So there is a developing issue for you as communications major, uh, majors. Uh, what are the ethics of communication? What, what law should apply? And there's a, a brand new conversation uh, because of uh, the evolution of technology. <clears throat> and uh, just maybe one example more. Uh, I don't know. Uh, sure, I mentioned the instance of Shirley Sherrod, I think, in the book, uh, which to me was fascinating. Shirley Sherrod was a uh, assistant secretary of agriculture. Uh, she's an African-American woman. Uh, a blogger excerpted a speech she gave to make it look as if she had been um, racially discriminatory against white farmers. That clip was completely inaccurate. It was picked up by CNN, it was picked up by the New York Times, it was picked up by Fox, uh, all because of the emphasis on speed, not because of the emphasis on accuracy. 
By mid-afternoon, she was condemned by the NAACP. By late afternoon, she was condemned by the White House. By later afternoon, she was fired. And by the next morning, everybody said they were wrong. So this was an example both of um, speed overcoming uh, accuracy, uh, pack sort of journalism, and um, the impacts of, of, of blogging, uh, which now is so, so important. So uh, I'm, I'm glad to discuss this any way you guys would like. Uh, we can, you can just bring up some topics and glad to discuss them and glad to be here in, uh, in cyberspace together. <laughs> Professor, I might ask, as a law professor, can you help us? And we do have students from all disciplines, uh, a variety of disciplines in this honors colloquium. So we do have a couple of communication majors, but others as well. But as a law professor, um, you know, we do have a Bill of Rights, a First Amendment, a Fourth Amendment that specifies government search and seizure. What do we do about privacy in terms of this evolution over more than a century since the Warren and Brandeis article um, with respect to kind of what, what appears to be sort of a blurring of, you know, NSA activity and the data that Facebook collects and this kind of evolving environment that social media bring on? Well, it's a, uh, it's a terrific question. It is inc an incredibly quickly evolving environment. Uh, there are a lot of human instincts involved that are now mixed in with technology. We've always had the instinct to gossip. Thousands of years, hardwired. Uh, used to be a good way to get information. Uh, but also while you were gossiping, you could look at the person who you were gossiping with and assess their credibility. Uh, now we have gossip that becomes news and we have no idea who did it. It can be much more destructive. We also uh, are hardwired to uh, want to connect and want to belong and have friends. And that used to be discussing things with four or five of our friends, having a cup of coffee. And now it's posting and, and exchanging in ways where we share a lot more information than we <clears throat> understand can be shared otherwise. And I know everyone has read their uh, terms of service agreement thor thoroughly <laughs> and understand it. I know I don't. Uh, but I know it means that it, that information is distributed widely. And that's that creates a new environment. Uh, the NSA, another natural instinct is fear and desire for security. Top instinct. So if we're concerned about terrorism, if we're concerned about uh, the next school shooting, and we'd like somebody to prevent it, and why wouldn't we? Uh, we're willing to give up some of our privacy. And the result is we're, we're giving up uh, perhaps more than we understand uh, in terms of collection of information. And, and uh, if there's a remedy to that, it's probably transparency, that is to know exactly what's going on, and uh, increased public understanding. But uh, it's a, the evolution of the law has been very slow. Uh, we don't have uh, remedies that are quite built for this new situation. And uh, we've always been very protective, uh, as we should be, of the disclosure of truthful information. Uh, I, I, as I mentioned in the book, uh, there's some other cultures, uh, Europe and, and others, where uh, they're willing to do more of a balancing legal test with individual dignity and disclosure so you would get results um, like I discussed in, in, in Raleigh and a couple of these other cases that are highly unusual in the United States. Uh, so uh, you're coming along at a very important time to engage in that dialogue and particularly people in the, in, in the communications and media area are well placed to, to talk about that both in terms of policy and, and ethics. You said you're from Spain? Yes. So there's a big case now, Google Spain. I know, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, where 
the EU and Spain is saying uh, the right to be forgotten uh, exists. And uh, it, it seems to me that there's a, all laws are based on culture. Uh, you, you can't uh, have laws that are, that are contrary to a culture uh, because they won't continue to be supported. There's a culture that uh, recognizes uh, the importance of dignity uh, in, uh, in Europe and a lot of the, the countries there. Uh, and the United States, uh, because it was based on, during the creation of the First Amendment, a, a rebellion against uh, oppression and a supreme importance of being able to communicate and point out what's wrong with the government. So we, we've uh, never reduced uh, the importance of that, and yet we, we, we do have a, a right to privacy that we're struggling with, but um, in the EU, it's part of the Declaration of Rights. It um, can be a driving force in opinions, uh, and has been. So I, I think it's a cultural, a cultural distinction. And uh, that's it's been around a little bit longer <laughs> than it has in the United States. And uh, to, the, to the extent the uh, folks in the United States and you and others become more uh, understanding or uh, feeling that dignity is important, uh, we'll, we'll start to seek uh, a little more balance or opportunity to protect privacy. Do you see anything in the current political environment, we're in the throes now of a presidential race again, that would lead to uh, changes that would be more explicit in protecting privacy? Maybe. <laughs> uh, after the Snowden revelations, there a large... Uh, public conversation about uh, government intrusion, and the the American culture is really far more concerned about government intrusion, uh, and that it is about uh, press intrusion or others. Uh, but not much has happened because uh, as soon as that conversation gets specific, uh, the question is raised. Well. Do you really want to uh, miss that next terrorist? Uh, there was a, the director of the NSA, uh, General Alexander, said that you truly want us to prevent the next attack, whatever that is. That's hard. Uh, and basically he described it as saying he wants to find a, a needle in a haystack. And he said, so therefore our task is to look at the entire haystack. And the entire, the entire haystack is everybody. <laughs> so uh, there's, uh, that is the basic premise that if you want us to uh, prevent, you know, we, we, we've probably all seen enough mistakes uh, in law enforcement and security trying to prove a crime or prove the wrong crime or arrest the wrong person. How much harder is it to stop someone prior to crime. So it's very difficult. But that's uh, what in our, uh, in our hearts we'd really prefer. Keep it from happening. Next question. Yes. I mean, obviously you mentioned several times in the book that technology is always going to move faster than the law. So how are, you know, courts handling that stuff now? Is it based on precedent? Because obviously that's a huge thing in the legal system, is it precedent based on other free speech or free, you know, expression cases, or is it just kind of a case-by-case -case basis of, you know, we got to decide now and now is the time to create that precedent? Well, that's, that's a great question because the law, as we structure it, is based on the past. Mm -hmm. So we're always looking at the past, and the question is, can are there principles that we can translate to uh, the present world, there's there's one uh, really good example that came, I think, about as that uh, book was being published, the Riley case in the United States Supreme Court. Uh, it's it's a fascinating example. It, 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 the question is whether 
the police without a warrant can uh, look at someone's smartphone. And the United States Supreme Court Justice Roberts said, no, you can't. And said that the Fourth Amendment, uh, which, if you recall historically, was really based on things as specific as the home and the evolution of the Fourth Amendment uh, had to go past places, the actual physical locations, to information. And uh, he said in the opinion that uh, inspecting someone's cell phone could be more intrusive than walking through their home. And that's, an that's a fascinating conclusion, but I think you could understand that. Uh, if you have somebody's smartphone, you would have uh, their locations, their friends, their email, their texts, their contacts, their pictures, uh, a massive amount of information and mosaic about who they are and who other, uh, and their relationships, their appointments, their medical conditions, uh, all of them in one place. And uh, a warrant, even a warrant for a home might not generate that much information. So it's, that shows that the law can <laughs> sometimes make a leap forward. Uh, we're not there in a lot of other instances, uh, and in particular with this issue dealing with media disclosure, because we have, in the United States, such a strong commitment uh, to avoid prior restraint and to allow uh, for media to disclose information because of the benefits. Media or anything related to, to speech, we've, we've had that uh, conversation when it related to uh, uh, protests at funerals, etc., and continue to bend over backwards uh, to allow speech and, and, and expression. Uh, depends on what's in that, that private space. If it's in a public area, uh, we generally haven't uh, viewed that as private space. So therefore, if something occurs, um, a CCTV camera anywhere, that that's, we haven't ever viewed that as private. If you're doing something in public, it's public and it's fair game for the media. And the expectation of privacy issue is really very becoming more and more complicated. Uh, does the fact that we think that we have an intrusive society mean our expectations are lower? And is it a self-fulfilling prophecy? <laughs> uh, are the expectations different in 2015 than they were in 1915? I'm sure there are. Uh, and you talked about the Brandeis article. Uh, and they were of, uh, complaining about the intrusiveness of photography. So imagine what they would think now uh, about what's available in terms of gathering information and distributing it. So it's got to evolve. Uh, and uh, the, the, the space issue is, is one of the, uh, the issues, but the, the media is going to be granted if it's in public spaces, a lot of leeway. But who, who are the media is a question that you've grappled with, and are these individual bloggers the, the media that we're protecting, right? Well, yeah, and if you want to write a really good graduate paper, <laughs> uh, tell us what the difference is in, in terms of free speech rights between an individual blogger and the New York Times. I'm not sure there's any difference. Now, the New York Times can get a credential uh, to be in the White House, uh, or uh, Sports Illustrated can get a credential to be on the sidelines for a football game. But is there any difference in what the individual can publish and what uh, mainstream media can publish? And I, I don't think there necessarily is. I've asked a lot of law students to show me, <laughs> and uh, I don't think there is. So the, if, if the issue is 
what can I as a blogger say? I think I can say anything that the New York Times can. But I don't have uh, what we've talked about as um, vetting. We don't have gatekeepers. I don't have a gatekeeper. I'm, I, I write whatever I want to. Um, so uh, then it's a matter of limits. Is it uh, if what I'm saying is an opinion or if what I'm saying is satire, I'm fine. If I'm suggesting something as a fact, then it can be defamation. So uh, we do, we, we have really uh, definable limits on falsehoods. Uh, but one of the things you should think about as individuals, what would bother you more, somebody saying something that was false about you or even clearly false, or somebody publishing one of your really private truths uh, that you've held to yourself uh, for a long time? Makes me more nervous to think about <laughs> what somebody might say about me that's is true that I don't want uh, I don't really want to share with people. Yeah, I, I think I mentioned a case in there called uh, the Krinsky case. If you find that it's uh, it was clearly if literally taken uh, defamation over uh, on a CEO in California, uh, but the. Uh, in defamation with blogs can be a two-stage approach at the moment. First, you don't even know the identification of the individual, so you have to prove to the court that you have a prima facie case of defamation before you can even find out who the individual is. Uh, and in this case, the, the court said you don't have a prima facie case because everybody knows that blog is satirical. So even though the statements may look like they're factual, that that is, that is a blog that people are to understand is satirical. So it's very interesting uh, and a fascinating situation because that precisely that same paragraph published in the San Francisco Chronicle <laughs> would probably be defamation. But since it's published on this blog, and that blog is known to be and intends to be satirical, which doesn't therefore pretend to be the truth, then the court will treat it differently. So I think uh, if that's what you're describing, something that's clearly defined as satire, then that's a different test. Part of this is what is their everyday life a demand of people? And uh, a lot of what it demands is to disclose information, uh, to be on the Internet. Uh, if you're normal, you're supposed to be on Facebook and you're supposed to text and participate. Uh, so you've got to go to extraordinary lengths <laughs> to not be on the grid. But an interesting point is, uh, historically, the rich had more access to privacy anyway. I mean, that is the, the gated community, the walled house, uh, as uh, opposed to uh, working class neighborhoods and crowded communities. So it, it's, it's interesting that um, <clears throat> you make that analogy in, this, in the uh, cyber world, and that's, it's probably true. You can pay for technology to encrypt yourself more, uh, make it more self, uh, make it more difficult to uh, hack or obtain information about you, or just be off. And uh, it's, uh, I think that's a rational statement. I wanted to jump in with with one follow up question. So I was thinking about uh, how much that I buy into the idea that individuals value privacy and that there is this human dignity question. And then I started to think about one more complicating factor that I wanted to, to raise with you. So we've had this whole discussion about under the law, corporations essentially behave as individuals, right? Um, and that made me think about the thalidomide cases in the UK where you know, there was basically a press gag order against reporting on the, the trial 
And thus, there were these women who kept taking thalidomide and their babies had birth defects. And it was in part because they couldn't be publicized by the press. So is there anything that, that we can do to kind of balance in that way? Well, I think in the, uh, there's probably good news in the new world because it's more and more difficult to keep something like that, quote, under wraps. Um, there was in Great Britain, they, they tried something called the super injunction, which may be worth looking up. And that was, you were supposed to be able to get a super injunction to keep the press from even publishing who filed a lawsuit. Now, uh, that dealt, uh, one lawsuit dealt with a soccer player, footballer, uh, and of course somebody found out about it. So even though the press was prohibited from saying anything, somebody texted or tweeted to another country and in the other country, which was not subject to the super injunction, they wrote about it. And then, of course, the British press could copy what someone else said, so the whole thing didn't work. <laughs> uh, but there, there is, um, I don't know, in the, in the new world, the gag order is going to be difficult. And in, in, on balance, something like uh, thalidomide, uh, that's a public health issue. In other words, if you were balancing uh, whatever intrusion there was against uh, the public good, to know that, it seems to me the public good wins. Uh, there, the other instances we talked about are maybe um, <clears throat> more clearly on balance, something like a video of Don Branchow's death. Uh, the video doesn't bring much to the public in, in terms of public value. And again, the more sophisticated approach is to say, we have a medical examiner's description of the video, which is frame by frame. So if you want to know what happened uh, for any purpose, if you want to know the information, you can get that. Matter of fact, you can, you can get it right now online, but you can't get the video. Well, does that make sense? Uh, well, it's the information that's important to the public, given it's accurate. The video is has a completely different impact on the family, the public, uh, and the court accepted that argument. It's something that, uh, it's, do you accept that argument? In other words, if there was a video of someone who was a friend of yours being killed or dying, uh, is the existence of that video online more intrusive and more disturbing than the written report? Because anonymity has long been uh, very important uh, in, in free speech. If, if someone is expressing an unpopular opinion, it's important. Uh, even the, what the Federalist Papers uh, were anonymous. Uh, other other important uh, documents uh, have been have been anonymous, but at some at at some point when the materials are specifically intrusive and destructive, and that's an example we were talking about before, if um, a blog becomes directly threatening. Uh, directly threatening safety uh, and personal security, then the court may well order uh, that, that anonymity be, uh, be broken. But it's not, it, it's, it, it is a great question because we can't, can't just say anonymity is a bad thing because in many situations an anonymity has been important to encourage expression on, on difficult issues. And I think uh, <clears throat> when you have discussions about this, it tends to start to change when those attacks become personal and dangerous. You say, well, why don't we all get together and kill X? Or I would like to 
beat up and tend to. And, and there are cases like that, you know, in which case the, the courts will say, yeah, we, we, we're, we're going to ask the, uh, the ISPs and others to uh, disclose that information because there's an immediate threat. But it really, it's, uh, you can write a book on that. <laughs> But maybe the broader question is, cultures do differ fairly yeah. fundamentally on these things. So bringing it back around to privacy, it's, it's going to be a challenge, isn't it, to get uh, you know, the UN aside to get everybody on a similar page with an interconnected mobile internet world we live in. It's going to be very difficult. Uh, but there are some examples. Uh, once commerce comes into play, and data security is an issue. And uh, there's a recent, very recent opinion by the European Court of Justice uh, that uh, there was a uh, safe harbor provision in the EU that allowed the United States, uh, the United States corporations to do business in Europe. And it made special provisions that designated their practices as uh, as compliant. Now the European Court of Justice said that doesn't really make sense. <laughs> uh, so you got to re-examine all of those individual company policies. Uh, what I thought was one of the more interesting examples was uh, security uh, and disclosure on airplanes. Uh, the EU said. Uh, we do not expect for our citizens to disclose a huge amount of personal information to get on an airplane. And the United States said, well, that's fine, but you can't land in the United States <laughs> unless you disclose this amount of information. Uh, and this was a few years ago. So that was fascinating consequence. You could take off, but you couldn't land. So this didn't work out <laughs> very well, and I worked out safe harbor agreement which is to say we're going to designate that as compliance. Uh, but it, uh, in actuality, probably wasn't in full compliance with the EU, and now there's a challenge. So there's, the, there's this, since we are more global in terms of commerce and since data collection and distribution, whether it's financial uh, or otherwise, uniformity is going to have an impact. And data security is going to have an impact. And uh, a lot of the European practices have had a real impact on Latin America because they do so much business. And uh, there, the Latin American countries are complying. So it's uh, the story isn't over <laughs> uh, at all, but you can there and there continue to be these fundamental differences on on free speech which are fundamental to various societies and cultures, and I, that's not going to be easily abandoned. It's going to be, uh, there may be some balancing, and then there may be an opportunity to do that, and we can learn from each other.